I'll have what he's having. President Biden spoke for one hour and eight minutes, and if there are any questions left about his viability as a presidential candidate or as a president, or about his stamina or his withitness or any other questions that have been raised by the Republican plot, the Republican Biden age plot, they were dispelled. I am his junior by 17 years, and I could not possibly talk uninterrupted for an hour and eight minutes, despite my reputation and despite my attempt to do that tonight. Thank you for joining us here live from iHeart World Headquarters in New York. This is our special Countdown with Keith Olbermann podcast post-game show after one of the more remarkable States of the Union addresses in the history of this nation. The first seven minutes of this State of the Union were not just as powerful as President Biden or before him Vice President Biden or before him Senator Biden has ever spoken. It was perhaps as powerful and as forceful and as determined as any first seven minutes in the history of any State of the Union address ever. I was not expecting what he did. He came out punching, forceful, strong voice. He threw boiling oil on MAGA, on Trump, on the Republicans without ever mentioning a name. He segued from MAGA's interference with the defense of Ukraine and the value of Ukraine to our defense here, directly into the questions about what they were saying and telling their own people about January 6th. This was all delivered in an extraordinarily forceful voice. He was not quite yelling. He was not quite speeding through the script. He hit it pitch perfect, especially for the first seven minutes, but realistically through the entirety of a 68-minute address. There was only one interruption from some protester in the gallery who made some shrill sounds that were barely intelligible. That threw him off late in the speech, but they certainly did not get time, any of the Republicans in the audience, to make any point of any note in terms of audio, in terms of what the viewers at home saw. And that was largely because Joe Biden never took a breath. So I think that if this was, as the White House was expecting and hoping, and I will confess to having doubted that this was possible, if this was the reset moment at which he could immediately refute all questions about whether or not he had the stamina to be president for another four years, he did so. One would hope he does take a breath sometime in the next four years. I wanted to interrupt one thing about this, but I did want to say that if it had been a fight, they would have stopped it after seven minutes. The subject of Joe Biden speaking in public is a very nuanced one, and it's one that I have some immediate experience with and personal experience with. And if you are a listener to the podcast, you know I've told this story several times on it since we debuted in August of 2022, and I've told it in other venues. I once told it during an interview on MSNBC with then-candidate for the vice presidency, Joe Biden. In 2007, I got a phone call from his press secretary asking me to have lunch with the senator the next time he was in New York. And I asked if this was about policy because in my naive way, I didn't think people who were on television or being political pundits or even anchors should ever consult with candidates about you know, policy. This makes me kind of naive in terms of what's going on in the present moment, both on the liberal and on the conservative sides of things. But I was told by the press secretary, no, this was not what we were talking about. He just wanted to talk to me about public speaking. So we sat down at a restaurant that is, in fact, not far from here, and he was a delightful, immediate visitor and part of my life. He walked right in, told me about watching my sports career, and told me, remembered meeting me in a hotel in Los Angeles in 2000 during the convention there. And then he got right to the point, which was, he said, you and your commentaries. Every time you do a commentary, I get a hundred emails the next day from my constituents, from my staffers saying, listen to this guy and his righteous indignation. He hits it just right. He said, then when I go onto the Senate and say angry things and say things with righteous indignation, I get a hundred emails from my own staff saying, you seem crazy. How do you do it, man? How do you not seem crazy, but you seem righteously indignant? I said I hadn't really given it any thought, but I'd be happy to help, but I had a question for him first, which was, you've been in the Senate since 1973, and this is the first time you've asked this question? Well, the words were no sooner out of my mouth before I said to myself, internally only, that's not some friend of yours there, that's a politician. He's going to get up and leave the dinner or the lunch now 
and perhaps hit you on the way out. Instead, Joe Biden did this. Many laughed. He uproariously laughed, and he said, that is so funny, and that is so true. And then we went about the issue of analyzing how to be angry, how to speak forcefully, and yet how not to seem, for want of a better term, crazy. I do not think, and I'm mentioning this only because it is a slight bit of personal insight into the man, I do not think that the lunch that we had in 2007 had anything to do with what you watch tonight in the State of the Union. However, if we were to have lunch again about the subject of speaking in public, the person who would be asking all the questions would be me, and the person who would giving, be giving all the advice would be Joe Biden. That's how forceful I thought he was tonight. Let's go through a resume of what we heard here, at least some of the highlights, play you a few of the clips, and then give you some of the context, including something I've been teasing all day about a new poll from Emerson, a very respected polling uh, operation out of uh, Massachusetts that really does cast the presidential campaign in an utterly different light and, in fact, puts President Biden ahead in the campaign polling that they have done. And we'll get to that and other things, too, and I will take some of your questions off the rapidly accelerating feed here. But let's go through a few more of these things. His only flaw, to my point of view, was the opening joke. If I were smart, I'd go home now. And then he proceeded to knock the hell out of Donald Trump and the Republicans for, as I said, seven minutes in perfect form and a one hour and eight minutes in total. He listed his achievements. He discussed and got a standing ovation for the political power of women and the fact that the Republicans were soon going to find out just how powerful it was just again. He went through the plans for the next four years as president, mortgage price cuts, drug price cuts, education that would extend to preschool for all, reading by the third grade for every student in America, lowering the cost of college, and reinstating the child tax credits. There was one motif that continued throughout the first half of the speech, certainly, and then I think that the man in question noticed he was doing it. If you looked over to the right side of the screen, over President Biden's left shoulder as he gave this address, you saw the man who is, for the moment anyway, the latest Speaker of the House, their fifth string choice, Mike Johnson, who sat there and, at least for the first half of that speech, did this. as if he were fighting himself. And then I think he sort of tapered off towards the end when he realized that people were probably able to see him doing that. Again, I don't know that it's gonna matter much in the long term, or certainly not in terms of the campaign, in so much as they'll probably have another speaker before the end of the year, and certainly before the election. There was one attempt to interrupt this speech by who else but the worst-mannered American, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who wore, in violation of House rules, a a uh, campaign insignia, a MAGA hat, tried to bait the president on the walk-in, apparently did not succeed based on the laughter of those others around her during that walk, and then tried to shout the president down on the issue of the border bill. In fact, as she shrieked, in a complete surprise, which I'm sure will put off a lot of those on the far left, and I do consider myself on the far left, the name of Lakin Riley, the murdered uh, a murder victim of an undocumented immigrant was not just invoked by President Biden, but he produced a button with Lakin Riley's name on it from under the podium. The value of this in terms of strategy and in terms of policy for the year ahead, for resolving the issue at the border, for installing some form of chaos under benign and humane leadership rather than letting the situation rot and get worse and worse and not be addressed in any fashion until January of next year. That can be debated, but I would rather have it in the hands of humane people who could take the advantage of a bipartisan operation to install humane systems at the border that would in fact reinstate something in terms of organization. And the pulling of the Lakin Riley button almost produced an audible sound of air going out of MAGA balloons nationwide. They said he wouldn't even mention his name. He had the button handy. And then he went right back to the actual point of the thing. We all came from somewhere, the president said. We can fight about the border or we can fix it. I'm ready to fix it. Send me the border bill now. 
And he, in fact, invited once again, as he has previously in videos and in social media, he invited the former president, and since he didn't name him, I don't have to name him either, do I? He invited him to work with him to encourage Congress to pass and send the bill to the president for his signature. He went on to urge once again and to insist he would once more ban assault weapons. He then took on the Israel-Hamas situation. It is a tightrope. It showed anybody walking over it will have to maintain their balance. He made it to the other side and he introduced what we knew in advance he would. The news that had been leaked because obviously they wanted an international headline and for all the talk of Israel and Hamas in this country, the story remains in the international media in other countries. It remains covered probably four or five times as much as it is here. He brought up this subject of a humanitarian pier through which to Gaza humanitarian aid can be delivered under the auspices of but not involving any actual U.S. military personnel. And then he moved towards his conclusion. When he talked about his heroes and what brought him into politics and what maintained his vision for the future, he invoked the name of Martin Luther King Jr., not certainly a surprise, not a rarity in American politics, not a rarity for the State of the Union address. We are now hearing of Martin Luther King the way previous generations of politicians used to invoke Thomas Jefferson. Whatever it is, you believe in, you simply say that Thomas Jefferson used to believe it too, now you say it about Martin Luther King. But he also brought up, and I thought it was an extraordinarily adroit move, just, just for the reference, he brought up Robert F. Kennedy Sr. And thus, without ever having to mention him, brought up the rogue candidacy, the stalking horse candidacy of the unfortunate Bobby Kennedy Jr., who is there, as you know, as a stalking horse on behalf of Trump to draw votes away from Joe Biden. And again, if I may interject a truly personal note, Bobby Kennedy Jr. was, before his deterioration of the last decade, a friend of mine. I knew him only marginally. I knew him because of his work on the Hudson River near my home where I grew up, and I had admired him for that, and he had admired me for my commentaries. And he had said at one point that I was his hero, and I now regret what has happened to him more than almost anything I have seen in the political landscape in this country in the last 20 years. But now, Joe Biden introduced Bobby Kennedy Sr. and what he stood for, simply by the simplest of references. And that is one thing that I would want to say in, in an overall assessment of this. There was almost nothing that was too long and almost nothing that was too short. Joe Biden hit all the points, and as I said, he went through them at railroad train speed, at high speed rail speed. And yet, each time you were not left thinking he's gone on too long about this particular topic, he's gone on too briefly, he skipped through this, he made a laundry list. One of the great fears was that Joe Biden, who has a history of the proverbial listicle, would go into a simple list of accomplishments and not tell any story. There were several themes and threads throughout the entirety of this, and I think he expressed it continuously, and it built to what was all these things tied together. I have a list of 10 things that I asked myself before this speech about whether or not he would do these things and what would happen if he did. He tied them together thusly. In my career, I've been told I'm too young. I've been told I'm too old. Whether young or old, I've always known what endures. Our North Star, the very idea of America that we are all created equal. Everything tied in together, including, without ever referencing the opponent that the Republicans are still maddeningly likely to introduce once again, inject into our bloodstream like poison, to borrow somebody's phrase. He invoked him, he bashed him, he made jokes about his own age, and he again, as he has always done, dating back to his earliest speeches in the Senate, including the ones that his staffers would send him emails and say, you sounded crazy. He always tried to bring us back to the point of America. There are very few, I think, romantics about this nation left. And Joe Biden happens to be one of them. And we are fortunate, I think, that we happen to have a romantic about the United States as president of the United States. We are all developing and developing more rapidly as each year goes by a cynicism about this country and what can happen to it under pressure and what can happen to the guardrails that we have depended upon for all of our lives, which are proved to have been made out of paper mache. Joe Biden still believes in all of those things, and I think he managed to express every one of them in great detail and at great speed, and again, 
Can you believe that the entirety of this speech was considered to be simply a referendum on whether or not Joe Biden would fall into the orchestra pit? When did that get erased? When did he accomplish that? Seven minutes in, when did he erase it? 15 minutes in, how long did the speech seem to you when you looked down and saw that you'd been watching for half an hour? I'll say it again. I like my ability to talk. I have made a lot of money off of it since I was about 16 years old. I couldn't do what he just did. Let me go through some of my own checklists here to give you something more substantial than simply a recap, and then we will hear again some of what Joe Biden said so that I can be refreshed in what I wanted to say to you about them. Did he mention Trump by name was the first question that I asked myself. If you heard the podcast this morning, I said that he should declare Trump the greatest threat facing the country. Well, he did not mention Donald Trump by name and still managed to do basically that. Still managed to express that if not the only threat facing us, Trump and his influence is as great as anything else menacing this nation and the free world and our role in it and also the control of what is happening in Russia and other countries in the Russian area of influence. Did he attack Trump and MAGA by name or inference? Yeah, I think so. He did that at about three minutes in. Did he reference the January 6th coup or insurrection? You bet your ass. Did he reference Trump and defunding schools that would require vaccines? This oddly was left out. This new idea, which I'm sure you've heard about, that Trump will not fund any school in this country that requires students to get vaccines. And we're not talking about anything that is even mildly controversial like the COVID-19 vaccine. We're talking about mumps and measles. And we're seeing what happened in Florida as a result of it. No, he did not mention it. Did he heckle back was my sixth question to myself. Yeah, he did. Number seven, did he joke about his age? Well, I think the phrase I may not look it, but I've been around for a while, is a sufficient joke, and certainly the opening remark was, in, in some respects, if I were smart, I would go home now. As I said, they leaked the Gaza relief port news in advance since this speech started at 2 a.m. in London time and throughout much of Europe and 3 a.m. in other parts. They had to get something on the news in advance before the European audience and, in fact, the audiences uh, in Israel and the Middle East woke up to this speech in the morning. So they got that out. But now he also put out many of these proposals about what education reforms should be done, this goal to get everybody reading by the age of three, I believe the current number is, certainly in the red states, is 33. He did discuss a tax credit for two years worth $400 a month uh, to all of uh, the uh, homeowners. Did he address the Supreme Court and remind them that presidential immunity means he could have them all arrested? No, he did not mention the Supreme Court. I was struck by the fact that several key members of the Supreme Court could not be bothered to show up. I guess it was Supreme Court bowling night. Did he invoke previous States of the Union addresses and key moments from them? I suggested, well, what were the most famous moments that have ever come up in the State of the Union? War on poverty, axis of evil, something like the Monroe Doctrine. And no, I don't believe that he was in attendance for the announcement of the Monroe Doctrine in 1823, but maybe that's a joke he could use next time. He did, however, make immediate reference to the four freedoms. We had a hint of this because that photograph that the Biden office put out on Twitter the other day of him doing his prep for the State of the Union included a page, and somebody at NBC News apparently took the page of that State of the Union script book, blew it up, and read through the first page, which simply had who he was going to greet at the start of the address. And they actually were able to read, I guess backwards, the word freedoms on the second page, rather an alert technical status, and also something that, uh, if you consider for a moment, this I know more about than you would, was something that would allow you to experience what it was like to work at NBC, where they would try to find things that you had left written in places that you did not know you had written them. And my 11th question, which I added just before we began, did he talk rapidly? Again, yes. Let's look at some of these highlights here first. Uh, the, the, the start of this speech, as I said, I don't know if this speech will be studied for it, its entirety, the, the length of the speech, all the nuances of it, but I do believe that the seven minutes that open this speech will, in fact, be studied throughout the future of American history, presuming there is a future America and that we're allowed to have history. So the first one I want to hear again and then react to in real time and give you a chance to react to as well. The attack 
the tying together of Putin and Trump, and Trump saying that if Putin were to engage in further violations of international law and attack other nations, as he has Ukraine, that Trump's response would be, do whatever the hell you want. Now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that, bowing down to a Russian leader, I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. <laughs> That's how he started. If you did not see this speech, and for some reason you happen to be dialing around online and you're seeing me talk about it, may I suggest you, you they're not going to like when I say this, may I suggest that you turn this off and go and watch the first seven minutes of the speech again? That's how he started. Not only did it express the forcefulness that is in Joe Biden's personality and the best of what he used to decry, decry in his own personality as, I sounded crazy, but it was tempered just enough so it sounded righteously indignant. Exactly the same attitude that I've had for the last nine years now, and I'm sure, and I know from my interactions with you, you've had too, which is what in God's name is going on in this country? How did all of these people either get here or get like this to create a world in which Donald Trump got more than 25 votes in a presidential election. There was that undertone to everything he said that touched vaguely on the subject of Trump or MAGA, and again, without ever mentioning Trump's name. And yet, he went right from the subject, that first subject of Putin and Ukraine and Republicans stalling on Trump's behalf and stalling because they are in thrall to Vladimir Putin. He went directly from that to the subject of January 6th and the denial of what happened and what we all saw happen in real time and what was condemned by Republicans in real time and what was condemned, and he'd never invoked Mitch McConnell's name, but I have a feeling that this was designed to give Mitch McConnell a sleepless night, although I don't know if we have to worry about that because the man with the age problem in Washington is Mitch McConnell. Nevertheless, the attack on the January 6th deniers was the second part of this speech that I think will be studied in years to come. In a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th, yeah. when insurrection stormed this very capital and placed the dagger to the throat of American democracy. Many of you are here on that darkest of days. We all saw with our own eyes the insurrectionists were not patriots. They'd come to stop the peaceful transfer of power, to overturn the will of the people. January 6th lies about the 2020 election and the plots to steal the election posed a great, gravest threat to U.S. democracy since the Civil War. But they failed. America stood. America stood strong, and democracy prevailed. We must be honest. The threat to democracy must be defended. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. I want exactly what we have been asking from every Democratic leader since January 6th. Talk about it in those terms. Talk about it bluntly. Recognize who in the government in the form of the Republicans in the House and the Senate and outside of it, manipulating the House and the Senate. Talk about what they hold as responsibility, not just for that January 6th, but for the January 6th they have planned to come in the future. I have a question that has been pulled from the list of questions from commenters on Twitch, in this case, from Thrignar. Good evening, Thrignar. Here's a question for Keith. Well, of course it's a question for Keith. Why else would you be putting it out on Twitch? In today's podcast, it was noted that states of the union, with one exception, have moved the needle less, 2% or less in either direction. Does Keith think this one might be more impactful than the historical trend? 
I was going to address this later, but let's go through that now because I went at it at some length because I found this rather exceptional piece of research from one of the guys at 538, not Nate Silver. And again, let me apologize. I was the guy who segued Nate Silver out of baseball statistical predictions into predicting elections. And then he went from what he was good at, which was taking all the numbers and averaging them, to believing that he knew without the numbers what was going to happen next. And then then he went crazy. Nathaniel Rakich at 538 did what 538 was supposed to do. He looked at presidential popularity polls both before and after every State of the Union since the year 1978. That would be 46 speeches by Carter, Reagan, Bush first, Clinton, Bush second, Obama, Trump, and Biden. The average change in approval after the State of the Union, good or bad, change in a president's popularity, 1.9%. All of them averaged together. The average result was in a boost of 0.3%. In other words, it's really not worth the president of the United States since 1978 even bothering to wear a tie to the State of the Union. Only once in the last 20 years has it moved by more than 2.1%. That was Obama, who got to 2.6% after his State of the Union in 2012. Only eight have had more impact than that, and three of those were by Bill Clinton who might still be the most effective speaker who's held the office of president, including Reagan, including Obama, including Biden tonight, in the last 50 years. He gained eight points after his first State of the Union address, or his informal State of the Union address in 1993, gained three in 1995, 10 approval points in 1998. Even George Bush, on the eve of invading Iraq, only went up 3.9% in 2003. You can screw it up, his father, H.W. Bush, lost five points of popularity after his first speech in 1990, I guess because the comparison to Reagan failed George H.W. Bush significantly. He regained that popularity in the ensuing year, then gave his next State of the Union in 1991 and lost another 5%. That's probably why he did not get reelected. The point is, the average net effect, the boost of three tenths, is actually inflated a little bit because Bill Clinton went up 10 points after the 1998 Monica Lewinsky speech. Obviously, it was not a speech about Monica Lewinsky. It was simply 10 days after the Lewinsky-Clinton scandal broke. But the media continues to insist this is vitally important, and thus the bar for actually impacting a presidential popularity issue is, is really high. The, most of the media is still pretending that this is 1998, 1978. They want to wake up and find that to be the case. They want to have influence. In other words, in 1998, 20% of this country saw the State of the Union address. Tonight, we don't know, obviously, what those numbers will represent. We do know that something like 55 or 60% of the audience is above the age of 55. We do know that it's probably not going to come in at 10%. It may be 7 or 8% of the country. The streaming audience for the speech itself is almost non-existent. So if Biden's popularity does increase in the next few days, and I would suspect what you will see, oddly enough, is that his popularity, his approval rating, will increase among Democrats, among people who have been baited in the last few months, pretty much ever since David Axelrod, of all people, brought this topic to the fore by questioning whether or not Joe Biden should continue or if the White House was not in fact, being realistic about the issue of an 81-year-old man running for president. If there are people worried about this, they would be on the Democratic side. In fact, there is polling, and let me reach for that, because that is a rather extraordinary thing, this Emerson poll, which I'll get into in a moment. There was one statistic in here that pertained to people worried about his age, and it was a small number, an extraordinarily small number. Voter, no, that's the independent voters. Emerson's polling not altered by, let's see, there was an age question. It was on line 125 of the new Emerson polling that was done Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. The question was, do, does his age raise doubts about him? 57% said it did raise doubts about Joe Biden. Not a serious consideration, 43%. The White House would probably say that's a pretty good number. And that was before tonight's speech. But for it to be 43% saying it's not a serious consideration rather than 51 or 52%, it means 7, 8, 9, 10% of Democrats, or maybe more than that, were actually worried about it. 
So if it does move the bar, it will move the bar, I think, I think, among the Democrats. And in any event, we'll go through the Emerson poll in a little bit, but I would point out that there are indications from that Emerson poll that the Biden popularity number was increasing and has been increasing sort of surreptitiously been below the radar for the last month, month and a half. Let me resume where we were. We uh, had talked about the first two sort of signal sound bites from this. And again, the real value of the State of the Union perhaps is in viral moments, just like it is the real value of everything else. Who's gonna sit there and watch through a speech of one hour and six minutes other than you and me and everybody in Washington? But to most people, they will consume this between now and sometime tomorrow in small bursts. So let's anticipate that. And I believe we had not yet gotten to the uh, issue of the role of the power of women in politics, which was uh, greeted, not surprisingly, rather strongly by the vice president. Let's listen to that one again. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? Look, it's a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court majority wrote the following, and with all due respect, Justices, women are not without electoral, electoral power. Uh, excuse me, electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you get right about that. about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. <laughs> if you, if you, the American people, Send me a Congress that supports the right to choose. I promise you, I'll restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. I truly do not think there was a wasted moment in this speech, except perhaps when, and this did not, I think, carry as loudly as it was intended to. We have identified someone on the floor who did, as Stan from YouTube asks, who was the idiot who started yelling? Well, I would have naturally assumed that Stan is referring to Marjorie Taylor Greene, and that would not have anything particularly to do with the State of the Union. That's what she does all day. However, we have now identified that there was a member of Congress who at some point started to yell lies as uh, President Biden talked uh, about, uh, what's the name of the guy, Republican president, the guy who preceded him, what was his name again? Couldn't have gotten through this. With, uh, with a team of a dog sled uh, team getting him through it. Couldn't have spoken for an hour and eight minutes. What was his name? Hump? Anyway. Representative Derek Van Orden yelled lies when Biden criticized Trump's sources say. Manu Raju, who's one of the uh, bright lights at CNN, was, uh, he said Van Orden was the member who yelled lies according to two sources who heard him. Representative Van Orden has a, what was, used to be called in polite circles, a disordered mind. Representative Van Orden is the guy who came upon a couple of, I believe, Senate interns who were taking pictures of the Capitol, and one of them was lying on the floor shooting up at the Capitol dome with his camera, and Van Orden basically tried to scare the hell out of them, threatened them, called the uh, Capitol Hill police on them, and then talked about how they were defiling the Capitol. Van Orden has several other problems, and I, I don't mean to assume, uh, perhaps you have seen this story. It has been growing, and I think it's gonna be one of the big news stories of the next year. There was evidence in one of the shooters uh, who conducted one of those nightmares uh, in public, a mass shooting, where they have in fact uh, autopsied and analyzed his brain. He was a former uh, member of the military, and there was significant damage to his brain, and it is believed that we have not really looked at the psychological or rather the physical reasons 
for the psychological condition that was once known as shell shock and has more recently been renamed PTSD among veterans and other members of the military. And it looks like, actually, that handling ordnance, uh, being around explosives, even just handling some of the high-powered uh, machine guns and other equipment and other uh, weaponry inside the military can cause literal brain damage. I'd like to point out that uh, Congressman Van Orden is a uh, proud veteran of our services. A couple of other questions. Hellfire Zombie from YouTube comment. That's an interesting family name. What would you suggest to Biden to maintain the momentum he generated tonight? Continue to talk at that speed. Gareth Goodworth off YouTube, obviously missing from the speech, unless I missed something, nothing about Iran and its proxies. I don't think you missed anything. I don't think there's any particular uh, disagreement on Iran and its proxies and its role. Uh, I believe, however, that I, they, I'd like to have been now, having seen how good the speech was, I'd like to have been the proverbial fly on the wall and looked at how they, this just in, thank you. I'd like to have looked at how they composed this and what they decided to leave out. Because one of the things that, that I had thought was, we are now entering the age in which people watching something that was going to last for at least an hour were probably expecting a halftime show. They were probably expecting him to say, I have more to say, we'll be talking about the Middle East, but first, Taylor Swift, and it didn't happen. But here it now, at some point, they must have said, look, the speech, even if you read it five times the normal rate of the human speech, read it faster than that Olderman guy reads scripts, it'll still last an hour and eight minutes. We're expecting a few four more years interruptions with chance. Well, they had to drop something, and I suspect that after looking at what he did about the Middle East, in which he successfully traversed, as I said before, this wire, this uh, balancing act over a bottomless pit of some kind, I suspect they said, let's not go further into the Middle East. Nuclear Magenta on YouTube asks, were you disappointed that he did not spend the entire hour focusing on Trump's danger to this country as you had hoped he would? No, I was, I was not. One of the things I actually do think that often happens is that the President of the United States knows a lot more than I do. So my thought was, if you're going to give a speech, and it's not perhaps going to, based on recent results, move the needle quite as much as you would like it to, that perhaps, you know, let's shoot the works here. Do the speech entirely about Trump. He did not spend the entire hour focusing on Trump's danger to this country. He only spent the first seven minutes, during which, as I said before, if it had been a boxing match, it would have been stopped. Lord Barl asks, what does he think, I presume that's me since I'm the only one out here, what does he think of trying to build a mulberry port in hostile territory and do so without us putting people on the ground to build it? It's off Twitch. You know, it's, it's again, um, if you've seen some of the things that the military does, and I'm not a military man, my father was, but I'm not an expert on any of these things, but I do know that often some of our great civil engineers, future civil engineers, started and honed their skills in the military, I would not put this past them. When they say they're not gonna put any boots on the ground or putting Americans in harm's way by building this humanitarian port to get relief aid into Gaza and get the thing up in a matter of weeks, I suspect they are talking about assembling it somewhere else in the Middle East in a friendly zone, perhaps an ally, uh, perhaps an ally with a gun pointed to their head, helping us out by giving us the space to do so. And I think those things can be accomplished. And again, I will, I know this doesn't sound like me, I will defer to other people's expertise on this particular issue, Lord Barl. That's Barl and not Barf, right? Steve Boyd from YouTube. Do you think the president was able to reach a healthy cross-section of all Americans, Dem, GOP, and Independent, or was he just preaching to the choir? Again, as I said before, there was some backfilling necessary here. There was certainly some weakness, as I have discussed on the podcast recently, even among personal friends of mine who I've known for 40 years and who I consider absolutely arch and staunch liberals who were beginning to get a little bit worried about whether or not the president could give that speech, that almost the content of it was secondary. What he managed to pull off was to give the speech, reassure anybody who had any doubts that he could do it, not just do it at this extraordinary Shakespearean speed and eloquence for seven minutes, but continue it for the full hour and eight. Not only did he do that, but the content of the speech was 
inviting to those who are not of the democratic faith. I think particularly this will apply to independents, some disaffected GOP, and again, I keep teasing this and I don't mean to, but the questions are good and they're relevant. There is stuff in the Emerson College poll that suggests that an uptick in Biden's popularity and an uptick in his favor in terms of what is happening in the polling and what is happening in the presidential campaign, this uptick began on Tuesday or after Tuesday when Nikki Haley ended her campaign. We'll get to those numbers in a moment. In fact, let's do that right now. We're gonna do that right now because those were the questions we wanted to get to immediately. The Emerson poll, I did not see it covered anywhere and obviously I could not watch everything this afternoon. I was at home with the dogs, but I did watch a good deal of cable television and after taking the necessary shower, I finished uh, with a few of my preparations for this uh, appearance tonight, uh, for this live podcast, and I did not see the Emerson poll mentioned anywhere. The fundamental number off the Emerson poll is Biden and Trump were tied as of Wednesday afternoon when polling ceased at 45-45 and 10% going to uh, essentially uncommitted, to use a phrase from the uh, primaries, or undecided. When those undecideds were pressed, the number changed significantly. When they were said, they were asked, you have to make a choice, who do you take? Well, most of them did, 1% apparently did not, but the final number turned out to be just about Biden 51, Trump 49. Trump had been ahead in this particular poll, the Emerson poll, since last September. They've conducted it every month. It is pretty good. It gets, I believe, an A minus rating off the 538 poll of polls. As late as December, it was Trump by four, 47-43. Biden had not even been even since last September. Why did this happen? This was done Tuesday, it was done Wednesday. Obviously, it was not done after this speech. We await polling, probably won't get any of that until Saturday, Sunday. The Sunday shows, God help us, Kristen Welker can say that Biden is allegedly president. But what we saw was this, Haley voters, are breaking 63 to 27 for Joe Biden. And again, that probably is an inflated number because many of the Haley voters, if they're not being separated out in the polling numbers, many of the Haley voters were either independents or Democrats. They weren't just disaffected Republicans, even though throughout the primaries, including the closed primaries that the Republicans have held so far, Trump has lost 30 to 40% of the Republican vote, and as I keep harping on in this uh, context of the podcast, if he loses 30% of Republican votes in November, if he loses 20% of Republican votes, Joe Biden will get 400 electoral votes. Voting strength, this is a surprise to me out of the Emerson poll. 83% of Trump voters say they will definitely vote for him. An impressive and strong and reliable number, except it isn't. 87% of Biden voters say they will definitely vote for him. Other bullet points that Biden can take from this, and again, where was this on CNN? Where was this on NBC? Where was this on the BBC? It wasn't. He leads Trump, Biden does, in voters under 30 by 43 to 37 with 20% undecided. Press them, press the 20% in the youth group under 30, and they break for Biden, and suddenly, the voters under 30 are polled accordingly, Biden 58, Trump 42, which is in keeping with what happened in 2020. This is actually interesting. Voters who call themselves independent, Trump 42, Biden 39, undecided 19, when they press these undecided, and my hat is off as a skeptic of polling since I started in this in 1998, they pressed undecided people to give them a goddamned answer. When the answers are included, it goes from Trump 42, Biden 39, to Biden 52, Trump 48. And this is amazing. 30% of Biden's voters polled as recently as Wednesday said they were supporting Biden because they opposed Trump. The reverse, the percentage of Trump voters who support him because they oppose Biden, which is supposedly the key, how Joe Biden is destroying this country and how Joe Biden is this and how Joe Biden is too old and could not possibly give a record-breaking State of the Union address for an hour and nine minutes. 12% of Trump voters are supporting Trump because they oppose Biden. It has almost nothing to do with what Biden does here or tonight or going forward. No wonder the Republicans are so desperate to dirty up Joe Biden as they will start to do when Robert Hur 
the former special counsel who was actually a Trump operative, is still scheduled to speak to a House committee next Monday about Joe Biden's age and infirmity and inability to make himself clear or understand things that had happened before. I suspect that some of the Democratic members of that committee will simply say, I'd like you to watch this tape of this speech that he gave last week, Mr. Herr. What kind of life has a man whose name is Herr been? Ask her, who, him, her? Emerson's polling, that's a joke about gender, I'm sorry. Emerson's polling is not seriously altered even by the presence of third party candidates in the multi party universe or multi candidate universe. Emerson has Trump 43, Biden 42, Kennedy 6, West 2, Jill Stein 1. 7% undecided. So it is still essentially a tie, even with the other candidates. On issues, and the economy is first at 29, immigration 20, threats to democracy at 14, health care at 12, and way down behind crime and housing costs, abortion access at 5%. One thing to note when you ever you see the list of issues and what's important to the American voters, these are not either or. Polling is done that way. Which is your most important issue? As if 29% of the country is worried only about the economy and could not give a rat's ass about any other topic, including access to abortion. In other words, a democracy threat, health care, abortion access worried voter, those would be, those people would likely be at around 31%. Those who are obsessive about immigration and the border would only be at 20%. There was the age question that I referenced earlier, that it was not a serious consideration, 43%. Compare that to the Trump indictments, 46% said that raised doubts about Trump to them, only 46%, underscoring once again that the Biden campaign will need to do a lot of analysis and a lot of pressing of the points of what Trump is being indicted for. And perhaps, perhaps the courts here will do something that will help us in that regard. There is a pattern. In most polls, Trump is slightly ahead with a lot of undecideds. This is the first poll I've seen in which they press them and they go, the undecideds, two to one or three to one for Joe Biden. What does it all mean? It means that, and again, this does happen, some politicians were right and this guy was wrong. The Biden campaign has been insisting this would happen, that the independents would break for them that he not only gets the undecideds and the independents, he will get them in droves. They have described this, and I'm quoting them, as the oh shit theory, that most independents and undecideds that they found in their own internal White House polling, or Democratic polling in this case, really did not believe that Joe Biden would be facing Donald Trump. They did not believe and have not believed until this week that Trump will actually be the Republican nominee for a third time. And when that reality hit them in the face, as it did when Nikki Haley withdrew, they would go to Biden. And that number was, once again, Haley voters breaking 63 to 27 for Biden. Almost no news organizations hit this poll because news organizations are territorial about their polls. You can't change the narrative before the speech that we just saw tonight. Their viewership depends upon it. And I did, however, see that the age issue was the only one that mattered. It was covered by somebody who had fallen asleep on the air twice in the last two years and somebody else who's had two facelifts. So that is where we are with the Emerson poll that I've been hyping and now I can't hype it anymore. I did want to play one more clip and then I will begin to wrap this up because I've taken almost an hour of your time. The recent moves and Rand Paul addressed this yesterday, I believe that Social Security and Medicare must be on the table and must be cut. There was at no point in this speech anything that Joe Biden said in a half-assed manner. All of it was strong, all of it was designed to get the point across, thou shalt not pass. But perhaps he was at his strongest talking about this issue. Social Security and Medicare gets cut, as you'll hear the president say now, over his strenuous objections. Tonight, let's all agree once again to stand up for seniors. Many of my friends on the other side of aisle want to put Social Security on the chopping block. If anyone here tries to cut Social Security, Medicare, or raise the retirement age, I will stop you. The working people, the working people who built this country, 
pay more into Social Security than millionaires and billionaires do. It's not fair. We have two ways to go. Republicans can cut Social Security and give more tax breaks to the wealthy. I will — that's the proposal. Oh, no. You guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? I kind of thought that's what your plan was. Well, that's good to hear. You're not going to cut another $2 trillion for the super wealth. That's good to hear. I'll protect and strengthen Social Security and make the wealthy pay their fair share. I do wonder whether or not the president brought all those rakes the Republicans kept standing on and hitting themselves in the forehead with, or if they just happened to be on the floor of the House chamber when everybody walked in. A couple of more questions, uh, a little other news to close it out with, and then let's just dive for a second into the other universe and get the reaction from Fox News to tonight's speech. Biden's State of the Union blasted as nakedly partisan campaign speech. Utter disgrace. Biden mentioned former President Donald Trump numerous times during his speech. Actually, he never said the name Trump first. He didn't say it at all. Andrew Mark Miller, Fox News, 1029 p.m. Eastern Time. President Biden's State of the Union speech was trashed by prominent political pundits for its political nature, with some likening it to more of a campaign speech than an overview of the state of the country. Is this... This, you handed me the script to this. This is the speed. This is what I heard him say. He said all these things. And, and he didn't really ad lib off this. This was the State of the Union. Well, they have to do stuff like this. That's what they're paid for because they couldn't get work anywhere else. I know many of them. There are good people there. They're the ones who have their resumes out every other place in the country. Attacking his opponent directly in the first minutes of his speech is unprecedented and perhaps the most partisan start to a State of the Union address in modern his uh, memory. AEI senior fellow and former speechwriter for President George W. Bush, Mark Thiessen, wrote on X during Biden's Thursday night speech. Well, if Mark Thiessen hated it, it was an A+. Plus. Congratulations, Mr. President. Biden criticized former President Donald Trump, blah, blah, blah. This man should never be allowed to take the rostrum of the House and deliver a State of the Union address again, Thiessen posted on X moments later. Well, we're covered through the election, Mark. You can dry your pants now. There's another bit of Fox News, by the way, and it does pertain to Joe Biden's age. This just in, Rupert Murdoch is getting married again. Rupert Murdoch, who is Joe Biden's senior by 11, by 111, by 211 years, is going to marry a retired, I can't even say it, he's going to marry a retired biologist who is 67. And again, Rupert Murdoch is 206. From Jessica Dwyer on YouTube, I have a question I will answer for you. Do you think Trump will actually get on a debate stage with Biden at this point after his lack of GOP attendance? I'm wondering, and I've been thinking about this in particular, so thank you for asking me, Jessica, because this has been much on my mind of late. I'm wondering if he is trying to get Biden to refuse to debate him. He's already proposed debating him now rather than waiting until the actual, say, months before, directly before the election. He's trying to have a debate now, and I suspect it is there to try to get Biden to refuse to do it so he can say, Biden has refused to do it now. And then at the time of year when the debates would actually get the attendance and get the attention of those who do not follow this as we do, some sort of September, October range, that he could then come back and say, well, you, wanted, you didn't want to debate me in, in April. I'm not going to debate you now. On the other hand, we do have to address that whatever it is that's wrong with him, whether it's aphasia or whether it is dementia or something else that's wrong, and there's another theory as to what is going on and why so many of the things that he says sound like the word he is trying to get but don't quite get there, like ballet and billet or something along those lines. Uh, there is a theory that uh, there are a thousand theories and have been working for 20 years that there's something not functioning correctly in his brain, and he may just think that what he just saw uh, in the State of the Union address from President Biden is something that he could clean the table with, and that would be a first evidence that there is something very wrong with Trump's brain, because no one on the Republican Party, including Nikki Haley, including Chris Christie, including uh, George W. Bush, including Ronald Reagan dug up and propped up, could have competed with Joe Biden tonight. Question for Keith from Cat Zed on YouTube. Do you think 
He missed a great opportunity to highlight the GOP's plan to cut spending for police. I think that's an extraordinarily good question. I, in fact, had this in my list of, was he going to do this? He did not do it. I suspect that uh, to bring attention to it again goes back to that culling process. If you wanted to, as, as I face every day, and as you do too, if you wanted to analyze everything the Republicans were doing that you could grab from them, roll up, and then poke one of their eyes out with, you could just analyze it for 24 hours a day and you'd never actually getting around, get around to do it. I suspect that some things were put over here in this other pile for, let's do this next month. From Twitch, Megan257. Keith, if Trump's cognitive gaffes continue and or worsen this year, do you think it would benefit or hurt Biden's image if he called it out? I think he is a man who knows when to do it himself and when to let others do it. And I would say something else. This is another behind the scenes picture about Joe Biden that I don't think I've ever told before in any kind of detail. I was the uh, moderator for what was not officially called a debate. It was called a candidate's forum at Soldier Field in Chicago during the height of the Democratic race in 2007 in August, the last week of August in Chicago, outside. You know what the temperature was? It was 152 degrees. It was actually something like 89 degrees and equal humidity and a threat of thunderstorms. And it was the AFL and CIO and 35,000 guys from mostly the Midwest, from mostly Chicago, were sitting out behind us drinking beer. And we were having this little debate. It was me as the MC. I sweat so much through my suit that I had to have it help peeling off my jacket when the show was over. In any event, at some point, a question was asked of all the candidates, and either I did not go to then Senator Biden for his reaction to whatever this question was, or he felt that someone had mis I believe somebody had misquoted him, one of the others, and this was when they were all still in it. John Edwards was still in it, and obviously Hillary Clinton was still in it, and Bill Richardson and Dennis Kucinich, and they were all out there with the, the eventual nominee, of course, President Obama, and the eventual Vice President Biden. And in, we took a break, and Joe Biden came over to me, and he said, when next time you come over to me, I'm going to go and, and, and address that subject. Where I, did, I was misquoted, and you didn't give me the opportunity to correct that. And I went, don't do it. And he said, what do you mean, don't do it? I said, it's going to make bad television. I'm not going to talk to you about the issue, but don't do it. We have coming up in the next segment, and you know this because I just said it, we have the widow of a man, a miner who had just been killed in a mine accident, I believe in West Virginia, and she's going to ask a question from the audience. And you're all going to get a chance to talk about it. You're the working man's candidate. I'm, I see you're on the list of who gets to talk about this. I can't have you all do it, and you be the natural one to do it. And he said, I still think I should, I'm going to bring that up. And I went, don't do it. Sure enough, she asked the question. Everybody in a crowd full of AFL-CIO members went, oh, duh. The, the, the pain was both palpable and professional. It was personal, and it was something that they had experienced firsthand in their blue-collar jobs throughout their lives. And Joe Biden knew it, too. And Joe Biden could not stop himself in 2007 and went off topic, consoled the woman on her loss, and then went back. I'd like to go back to, and it was at that point that I knew that his candidacy for president was over at that point. Today, and in the years since, one of the things in his elder years, and we can't say old age because he's got another five years in him. Clearly, after tonight, he may have another 50 years in him. But clearly, he has learned when to let other people do the dirty work for him and when to leave a less than perfect situation alone and have others handle it. And I believe what he would do in this is to just sit back and go, except in the debate format in which it might be necessary to point out that the man had just started speaking in tongues. I don't think it would serve him at all to mention Trump's increasing imbecility. That's my job. Awakening death writes, awakening death? Awakening death writes on Twitch. How many of you responded to Mr. Awakening Death in the, in the chat rooms here? Can we get the Olbermann poll calculation conversions on an upcoming podcast? The poll calculation conversions. Oh, the, the Olbermann number? I could do that again. Yes. Let me. Thank you, Awakening Death.
from BPJ on YouTube. Do you think that President Biden should address or comment in more detail about the developing criminal cases against Trump? Frankly, I'd like to see more of that. Most people are uninformed. They are uninformed. We noticed this about the, uh, the, all the comments. You saw this polling that was done in the swing states of potential Biden voters. In other words, everybody who disbelieved the 2020 election. Everybody who said they supported Trump was thrown out of this internal calculation, internal polling that was done for the Democrats. They came back in three swing states with an indication that the total number of people who had heard all of the truly frightening dictatorship and violent quotes and poisoning the blood quotes and everything else that Trump was doing, 31% had heard these statements. And when they were told these statements, apparently for the first time, the negativity score for Trump jumped by seven or eight points during the polling. So one can assume, and I haven't seen polling on it, that there is perhaps a similar, although I wouldn't think it could possibly be 31%, but if it's 51%, if half the public is fully unaware of the criminal cases against Trump, both by the special prosecutor and in New York, and even the case in Georgia, Perhaps there should be more efforts made in getting those things out. But the answer, like the answer about Trump's uh, instability, the answer is how much money did they put into those swing state ads and online and on television and on radio for the last couple of months of the campaign? Was it 140 million, 240 million? Put them in ads. They're much more effective that way. And all you have to do is run the tape of Trump. You don't have to have anybody saying anything, least of all being President Biden. Or at the end, you could just have him go in like this. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve that message. As God help us, it's true. Paul Dolan, did he go hard enough on the Supreme Court justices? Well, it was hard to say. I, I've, I've had my own negative comments, and I've been misquoted. I did not tell any of them to F you. But I've had my own comments about what the three uh, liberals remaining on the, just, on the Supreme Court did not do in the Colorado case, which was to state sort of the obvious that uh, the other six were apparently incapable of actually reading and could not see what the 14th Amendment said, nor the fact that, that since there was a Senate and House override of the 14th Amendment, it meant that it was automatic. And yes, the Senate and the House were the venues in which something could be done about someone being called disqualified for the presidency, but that thing would be to override it. Did he go hard enough on them? The ones who did the damage were too chicken shit to show up tonight, so it wouldn't have made that much difference. Celtic Ray Filmworks from YouTube. What the hell was Mike Johnson's deal? It was like he was spot welded to his seat. Again, you're looking at probably what I saw, which was the second half of that speech, when he realized perhaps someone sent him a text, perhaps someone in the crowd from the Republican Party held up a big sign saying, you're nodding in agreement, moron. And he decided the next best opportunity was to just sort of sit there and, as you suggest, not only weld, but seemingly melt into his seat like this. There's something very odd about Mike Johnson, and that's quite a quote to say when you consider his predecessor and the other people who were candidates for that job. There's something really odd about Mike Johnson. Really, really odd. One last question, and then we'll close with the other news before we sign off for the night. Twitch comment, Ray MM3852 underscore zero one. You chose that, or was it assigned to you? Mr. Olbermann, thank you for the formality. I'd like to hear your spicy thoughts on how MTG others acted. I'm not going to resort to something that was sent to me by an actual respectable member of the media, which was a picture that was supposedly of Neanderthal woman, and it looked exactly like Marjorie Taylor Greene, although I have called her Congresswoman Cavewoman before, and I think that fits. There's nothing out of character for that. The House won't do anything to her for violating the regulations against wearing campaign insignia, especially, not just on the House floor, but especially in the occasion of the State of the Union address. The only people who will be able to take care of her would be a Democratic uh, state legislature in Georgia by redistricting that area, which apparently uh, consists entirely of people with IQs under 40. All right, let's close with the other news. Uh, I mentioned Rupert Murdoch getting married again, and I should mention that we are expecting him to get married again. Number one, he is 92 years old. Two, the last time he was engaged uh, to, I believe, a woman who lost a bet, it didn't happen. She called it off. Perhaps there was family intervention. 
Here's the other news. Uh, if Trump disappears over the weekend, check to see if he has faked his own death because Judge Lewis Kaplan denied his bid on Thursday to stay the depositing of the $83 million he now owes E. Jean Carroll or forfeit his right to appeal that finding. That is $548 million that Trump has to come up with by the end of the month. But don't worry, he boasted on Fox that he has enough money to do anything he wants, so he better want to pay up to E. Jean Carroll and also the state of New York. Our second of six stories to close with, MSNBC and CNN both sold time to a Trump super PAC to attack President Biden's age. The first running of this jugular commercial was during Biden's favorite show, Morning Joe. I love you, President Biden, but that's what you get for watching Joe Scarborough. I mean, I worked at both networks, so I get it. The network sales divisions, uh, commercials divisions are brothels. But once again, I'd like to apologize for MSNBC. Number three, I'm sure you saw this, but I had a thought. Biden tweeted out highlights of a Zoom call with actors who have portrayed presidents in movies, ranging from Gina Davis to Bill Pullman to Morgan Freeman. Somehow they left out Marty Sheen, my friend Martin Sheen from the West Wing. Of all of the guys who've portrayed presidents, who's better known for it still than Martin Sheen from the West Wing? And I might add, Martin Sheen alone among all of these distinguished actors who gave something to that role. He was the one who just happened to have fleece jackets and letterhead stationery that reads the acting president of the United States. To me, one of the great troll jobs of all time. Here's happy news from retiring Democratic Congressman Derek Kilmer of Washington. He's filing a bipartisan bill instructing each member of the House to produce upon taking office a list of five backup congressmen one of whom would be immediately appointed to their office to serve out their term, or at least until a special election could be arranged, if they get assassinated. Congressman Kilmer is very worried about political violence in this country, and I really don't know on this one story whether to laugh or cry. Eileen Cannon, the former yoga correspondent of the Miami Nuevo Herald, and now Trump's concierge federal judge, ruled on Thursday that there will be a hearing a week hence next Thursday, to address Trump's motion to dismiss counts 1 through 32 of the stolen documents case on unconstitutional vagueness. That was the filing from the Trump attorneys. It's not an evidentiary hearing. It's also not likely to lead to such dismissals, just to more evidentiary hearings. Unconstitutional vagueness, we are told. I'm waiting for a Jack Smith filing in reply citing legal snideness. And lastly, perhaps the highlight of the day other than the president kicking the shit out of the Republicans. Since he left the Navy to run for Congress, Dr. Ronnie Jackson has referred to himself as a retired rear admiral. Trump has called him that as recently as last week. It turns out that when he left in 2019, shortly thereafter, he was busted. He was busted in rank to captain from Rear Admiral because of misconduct while he was White House physician and the world's only actual living, breathing vending machine that spewed out ambience if you put in a quarter. And frankly, and I'll close with this, Ronnie Jackson is lucky that the Navy did not make him walk the plank. So thank you for being with us. Uh, it's being 1143 Eastern time. Those of you who like to get the podcast at 12.09 AM on Friday morning, you may have to wait a little bit. I hope this was valuable to you. We will uh, meet with the entirety of management at iHeart, uh, 5,000 different people, and discuss in the next few days how many more of these we will do in the future. We may have a guest, although I have surprised myself because I have talked longer than the president did, have I not? I just got over, the, over that, didn't I? I thank you for your support on the podcast. As you know, there is a, uh, uh, an award ceremony uh, over the weekend in which we will not win political podcast of the year. However, the nomination really does count, and I'm honored by it, and I'm honored by your continuing support for the podcast. And I'd also like to say that I finally found a boss that I like most of the time, me. So uh, on behalf of everybody, including the dogs who contributed my not being home doing the podcast, in my suit closet uh, where I normally record it. I must do a video for you on what that looks like. Maybe not. I thank you, and I uh, wish you all of the good luck, and I hope it was, this was of use to you. I hope you agree with me on everything that I say, because why else would I say it? Thank you, good night, and good luck.